can um, view this as we as we talk along. Um, and I'm just going to bring over my other notes. There we go. So can everyone see that? OK. Brilliant. OK, so hello, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for joining me um, on this bitter um, lunch and learn session. Um, as Laura um, introed, I'm Jill Willis. I'm the director and co-founder of Attract Engage, um, which is um, a B2B growth marketing agency based in Essex. So um, the, um, the purpose of, um, of the session today um, is really to talk through case studies, but I'm going to give you a little bit of context first. So Attract and Engage, we, all we do really is B2B marketing. We're a, a plug-in support mechanism for business, uh, businesses of all different types across the construction B2B space. Um, and we've got lots of experience in-house, um, all of the tactics really to create a great B2B marketing campaign. So I'm going to be drawing on a lot of this experience today as we talk through. And I'm really going to challenge you to consider at every stage whether you're creating the right types of content for your target buyer or buyers at each stage of their journey. Um, I'm going to be drawing on lots of the experience that we use in, in some of those clients that you can see listed there today. Um, hopefully you're going to kind of come away at the end of this 30 minute session uh, with, I suppose, a new way of thinking about how you can include case studies as part of your content marketing mix. Um, so what's in store? Um, so first up, I'm going to dig into um, the five stages of the buyer journey. Um, I'm going to then talk about specifically B2B case studies, and I'm going to share a framework that you can take away and put into practice. And then I've also got some top tips um, from the Attract and Engage team. And fingers crossed, if all goes to plan, there will be a Q&A time at the end. So if you've got any questions at all, as Laura said, just pop them in the chat window and we'll get to them. Um, I'm, I'm going to try and keep things fairly short and sweet and, and simplify the process as we go. Um, and the end gain really of today is that you feel a lot more confident to really build in some creative um, and consistent case studies to support your sales efforts. OK, so um, number one really is the B2B buyer journey, because case studies are a really vital tool in the buyer journey but they're not the only tool. And I felt before we went on to talk about case studies, it would be really good to just spend some time putting them in context of the funnel. So as I'm sure you're all aware, you know, your buyers are coming in at the top, the awareness stage, and through sales and marketing working, you know, in alignment, your aim is to move them through that funnel as quickly as possible. So, you know, you've got the five stages there, Awareness through consideration, decision making, retention, and then obviously advo advocacy, because um, as I kind of bang on about quite a lot, sales and marketing's job is definitely not done when that sale is closed. You know, if you're not working to make to retain and then make your B2B customers advocates, then you're, you're really missing a trick. Um, so if you're doing this well, you know, what you should be able to see is the movement through that pipeline, prospect through to um, retained and very happy client, the uptick of pace. Um, you know, you should be able to track the degree to which your marketing content programs are accelerating that sales cycle down the funnel. Um, and then something else just to consider as well is in addition to these five stages, you've also got quite a diverse decision making unit in B2B. You'll know these, these, these prospects, these customers well. You've got your initiators and your users. They're most concerned with functionality, innovation, ease of use. You've got your buyers and deciders. You know, they're handling logistics, the budgeting, contract, investment, value. Um, you've also got your influencers who are a bit of a catch-all, but ultimately they're the guys in the organisation who are going to influence the decision. You know, we're finding a lot now that, you know, maybe the head of sustainability is one of the influencers who is who is really quite important within that decision making unit. Different for everyone, but that's that's quite a pertinent one at the moment. So look at your funnel, draw that out, draw out the five stages and think about, you know, are you um, when you look at those tools down the right hand side, 
how to guides and ebooks, thought leadership surveys through to your consideration stage, which is where we see the case studies, but also things like your one pages, your product demos, perhaps your webinars, all the way through to the things you should be doing towards the end, that high level educational piece, the exclusive content for your really important clients through to the testimonials, the advocacy opportunities where you're maybe inviting your top clients to, to join you on a platform to advocate for your solution. Act, rate yourself, you know, against that funnel, against those key tools that we're talking about in the sales process and be really honest about where your gaps are and where your strengths are. You can then really see where the case studies, which we're moving on to talk about now, really fit within this piece. They're at that second stage, the consideration stage. Buyers who have reached the consideration stage have had their trigger. You know, um, something has been identified. You can identify um, as the vendor that they are indicating readiness. You know, and in, in, in B2B, you know, the common triggers are likely going to be around their fiscal cycles. Maybe it's going to be something to do with, with new reg, regu, uh, regulations and legislation that's coming in that's, that's kind of forcing a change. Maybe there's economic changes or there's been a promotion or they've gone through an M&A. You can identify what those triggers are and you can see that, that, that they are indicating the readiness signals that you're looking out for. They're at stage two, they're considering. And this is the stage of the journey where sales need to be able to demonstrate how you have solved similar problem, problems for businesses that look like them. And if you can't do that with a case study, then you're gonna find that pace that we talked about earlier through the funnel. You're gonna find that is slower, is harder, and potentially if your competitors are doing a better job of demonstrating, um, you might even lose them at this stage. So that's why case studies as part of that sales process are such an important um, are such an important tool. OK, so let's now go on to this, the framework that, that we use. And um, I suppose to give you a bit of background, um, I remember creating my first case study framework for Hewlett Packard's enterprise division about 20 years ago. So case studies have been, you know, as, as you're, you're all aware, an absolutely kind of intrinsic part of the B2B kit for a very long time. And over the years, I've been able to develop a fairly straightforward four step framework. And that's the framework that we now use as a starting point for all case studies um, that we do for clients that attract and engage. So I thought it would be helpful if I share that with you today. And that's what I've popped up on the screen. Um, you'll see that it's it's really four key sections. Um, and by all means, you know, follow this section and use this as your template, aiming for probably around 600 to 1000 words across the board. What you want to be doing really is thinking, you know, that your aim is to explain the how and the why of the project. Ultimately, that is the most critical part of any case study. Your reader really wants to know how you've used creative thinking to solve the project's challenges. And that's going to be a project which they can see mirrors a project that they're likely going to be working on. So when, you know, early on in your planning stage, you will have identified certain segments that you want to really break into or expand your revenue within. You will have done some work um, around um, audience segmentation. So that will be informing where you're investing your time and energy on case studies. Um, you know, if you're in construction, you maybe want to be specializing in a certain ge geography, a certain, um, a certain budgetary size of project, maybe a specialism like heritage or education. Um, you know, that's what you want to then be focusing your case study work on. So you know the specific kind of problems that your target client is likely to be having and what they need to see demonstrated in the how and the why. What I would say is um, a common trap, I think that in construction, a common trap 
that lots of people fall into is to go about kind of listing bullet points of your scope of works. But I think by only talking about the work you've completed, you're really selling yourself short. So I would recommend, I suppose, that you, you know, within this process, you identify one or two key points. What makes this project different to any other project? You know, it's really easy as well to remember that you're kind of in it. You know, you're you're really at the coalface of this, potentially too close, I would say, to these points of difference. So step back and consider the project from an outsider's perspective. That's going to really help you hone in on the one or two one or two key points that are really compelling. I think a good example of this would be um, we wrote a case study on the refurbishment of 60 London Wall. Um, and at first glance, and to be honest, even to the client, it appeared like any other refurb project that they'd done. But, you know, digging into that, you know, and stepping back from it, the environmental restrictions on that particular project had been so rigorous um, that the, the passive... Um, fire protection subcontractor that we were creating the case study for had had to really kind of rewrite the entire thing and had to innovate entirely to create what ended up being a UK first sponge media blasting solution. And that ended up resulting in an 80% reduction of the environmental impact. You know, and in this case, we chose those two, two of the most important unique environmental aspects of the project and dismissed the rest. But I think for the client, they'd been so close to it, it wasn't perhaps obvious to them that that was entirely unique. Um, so I think, you know, that's that's a really important piece of advice um, if you're approaching case studies. I think also, you know, really hone in on the complication. You know, what were the biggest barriers to success? what was the most risky part, what required the most attention and planning, write them all down, you know, just get them all down. And again, choose one or two. You can't, you can't tell it all, but you will lose people and the impact of the message will, will be lost. Um, I think explain how you solved that those biggest challenges. And I would suggest really that you look at placing the larger emphasis on the how rather than the who, the where, the what and the when. Um, how you solve the problem and why this approach, your unique approach, was the best. Um, I think another thing that we talk about, you know, within the team and when we're when we're training in house on this is that it's really also about highlighting your client's success. You know, you want to use your case study to show how you transform the life of your client for the better, you know, without any angst, uh, without any kind of additional effort during the whole process. I think it's important to remember that the prospect you're talking to in the sales process, who's reached that stage two, their consideration stage, they want to feel confident that after they've hired you, they're going to be in a much better position than they were before. And that's the job of this case study. And by highlighting your client's success and showing you how you transformed their life for the better, how you made them better at their job, you know, zero angst, etc. You're doing that for them. Um, and I think, you know, another point on this is, uh, which I think a lot of people kind of fail to, to get grasp, I think, is that you should really be spending what feels like quite a disproportionate amount of time crafting the headline. Um, the headline is, is really you know, the most important element, because if the headline doesn't grab them, they're not clicking through, they're not spending any time consuming your content. So um, one way to do this um, is to use the, the golden nugget approach. And that's really the single thing that makes that project special. Um, and I'll, I'll give you an example here of a kind of a this versus that. So, you know, a generic headline, which you want to avoid at all costs, really, might be something like, you know, painstaking challenges overcome to complete retail refurb. 
you know, that's very generic. But if you spend some more time using that golden nugget approach, you can create, a, you know, a rather unique headline, you know, really pulling out, you know, the, the, the interest, you know, can't be done. One of the largest and most ambitious heritage, heritage facade projects in London's history completed at K1 Knightsbridge. You know, I think really do spend the time on honing down and templating out what can become the, the style of your really impactful headline. Um, it will be worth it because, as I say, that will make sure that the content you're going to then invest time and energy, potentially budget and creating, gets some eyeballs. Um, I think, you know, an another point when you're approaching this, this framework, you know, working through producing the content to fill these four sections is desk research. You know, you're going to be, you know, as we said at the top, you're going to have a whole list of the project deliverables. You're going to have spoken to the project manager, you know, who's dealing with this all the way through. Um, you'll, you'll have spoken to your client. You'll have a good sense of you know, the scale of the project, but do some desk research as well, particularly if this case study is being triggered by a regulatory legislative change that the client is facing. You know, put the case study in context and explore the bigger challenges that caused the trigger for the change, caused the trigger for them to step away from their status quo approach and use you and your solution in response to that. Um, it's the higher level business success stuff. This is where you make the business case really. Think about your C-suite decision maker here. May, they may even be the influencer, not necessarily the user, the day-to-day -day user. But think about that C-suite decision maker and how you can put this case study in the, the bigger business or regulatory or you know whatever context. Um, and my final point, I think, really, is as, as we look at this framework, is don't forget about emotions. Um, that there is an emotion factor in B2B purchasing. You know, I think we, we, we always think, you know, consumer purchases are typically really, you know, emotional, aspirational, and there's desire there, and that B2B is all about rationality. Um, but in fact, emotions do play a massive role in B2B purchasing. Um, particularly when we're talking about small to medium business owners, if, if that's your audience, um, and if they're purchasing goods for their business, and even large organisations, you know, the individual who has the ultimate purchasing responsibility is emotionally influenced. Um, if it goes wrong, that could really impact, you know, the business, its performance and their own reputation in role. It could influence them really negatively. So there's a lot of, of emotion going on there. So in the B2B context, and when we're thinking about a case study, what this means is we're looking at factors such as reassurance and optimism. Um, we want confidence and a vision for the future. And we definitely want to be demonstrating that we've got empathy for the buyer's business. So, so that's it. That is my simple kind of four-step framework, the exec summary the problem, the solution and the results. And I've walked through with you what I would suggest you think about and how you start to pull together and curate the material that you want to include and how you then um, um, prune back to really identify the most concise and most compelling story that you can for your audience. So the final step, and then we can get on to some Q and A's, is uh, the top tips. So I would say just start. You know, I think <laughs> understanding you know the benefits of case studies, as we've, we've just talked through, you know, a vital component of your sales content, vital for uh, buyers at that that's consideration stage to see that you can solve their problems, that you've got a track record of solving problems of businesses like theirs. Um, you can obviously you can see all of that, but you're not going to feel the benefit unless you start consistently delivering case studies. So just start. 
And I think if you're new to the case study process or kind of have let things slide, just start with a really basic format, use my four step framework and add more depth, you know, as you create more over time. Um, my advice would be as you kick off a new project, identify it then as a potential for a case study. Don't be revisiting it after the fact. Flag it early. Um, at the beginning of the project, you know, ask, um, is it unique, this project that we've scoped that we're about to start delivering? Uh, does it involve something a bit different or special? Um, is it innovative? Are you developing something new that's not been done before? Is it educational? Will it give my, you know, the, my audience new learnings to take away? Is it technical? You know, are we going to be able to demonstrate some technical know-how there? Um, and relevant. Am I starting work on a project that is fairly recent or topical? Is there something in the news agenda? Again, is it a legislative change, you know, regulatory change, environmental impact change? This new project that I'm starting. Is it worth me thinking about this as a case study now? Because I know when the project's done and delivered and I write it up, it's going to be relevant and it's going to be topical. So kind of, I suppose, score that, score that really early on against those criteria, anything that's scored, you know, 75%, I'd say go for it, flag it as a case study and start just brain dumping stuff into a document right from the get go. So when you come to write that up later on, you've already done the hard work. Um, tip two, I think, think about using multimedia formats. Uh, the examples I've got here are your, your straightforward PDF format that the sales team could share that you could have an asset pack of and, and direct people to, that you could, you know, list, you know, include within a brochure with a wider story about a solution. And they're absolutely your starting point. But also think about, you know, how you could perhaps turn your case studies into a digital showcase, how you could be pulling that content out, you know, to um, strengthen and put meat on the bones of um, thought leadership blogs. Um, you know, think about maybe getting the, the testimonial client to talk to camera or maybe get your project manager, um, you know, your delivery owner to talk to camera and, and, and kind of communicate some of those case study points. Think about how you can elaborate on the production so that you've got, you know, a, a whole suite of material, you know, that you can use and, and experiment with it um, because your, your, your target audience may like to consume their content in different ways. Um, you know, younger, younger decision makers coming through prefer are preferring video content, whereas your kind of your 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 heritage decision makers kind of further into their career may still want that written content. Um, and, um, you know, and, and finally, showcase different kinds of customers. Most but not all B2B companies have got a few different types of customer, uh, different industries. So just make sure that you're developing case studies that are really diverse and that speak to your distant, different industries, the different client bases and the different challenges that you are, that you're solving for them. Um, so um, there we have it. Um, why case studies are such a key component of B2B sales uh, and how to get your own case study production process rolling. Um, I know that um, the Networks magazine, uh, the Bitter produces, is coming out towards the end of July, early August. And in there, you'll find an article that I've written, which covers this topic as well, if you want to go into it in a little bit more detail. But for now, I think we can go to Q&As. Um, if anyone's got any questions, I would love, um, I would love to hear them. So let me just stop sharing my slides come back um, it looks like you've uh, must have preempted everybody's uh, questions because um all we're getting is feedback saying thanks Jill that was amazing from Sam thank you Sam and uh, there were some clap emojis going on and um, oh. no questions so I feel like you've headed everybody off at the pass unless anybody has anything they want to type quickly no okay Fab. You've, well, that's brilliant. No, that's brilliant. brilliant. <laughs> I, like that. I like that. And I know it's being recorded, so everyone can kind of take that away. Um, and uh, 
and listen to that again um, as they work through their, their case study process. Fab, um, are you going to make the um, presentation that you've done available to people? Yes, that can absolutely be available. Fabulous. And um, if anybody's going through that or listening to this and they do come up with some questions, are you happy for them to get in touch with you directly? Of course, absolutely. Ping me on it on LinkedIn, drop me an email, absolutely fine. Brilliant. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you so much, Jill. That was uh, really insightful. And uh, yeah, we always love your events. They're, they're just always top notch. So thank you very much. I'm sure I speak for everybody else. Um, oh, hold on a second. Somebody's dropped a question into the general chat. Um, do you typically get the end client to sign off on a case study? Um, yes. Well, well, we would always suggest that the our client that we're writing a case study on behalf of um, double checks with their client what they would like. I'm always way more comfortable if it goes through a double sign off process that our client and then their client, because then everyone is entirely happy. Yeah, I would definitely second that as well. Um, what we've stuff with the magazine that we've done, you always on a double double sign off, 100%. Yes. Um, okay, no, that's fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody. Um, I'm just going to go back to the main room just so you've got five minutes to chat if you want to. And um, then we'll call it a day. I will download the presentation um, that Jill's going to send to me and I'll upload that and the um, video to the Bitter page as a resource and um, get in touch with you all probably tomorrow with just details about the event. Jill, thank you again so much. You're very and, welcome. Um, I'm just going to send us back to the room now.